Good morning, everybody. Randy here with you again. I'm on my way to look at some very specific beds within the Hamilton group. Um, I'm looking at the Alden Pyrite beds, which are part of the Ludlowville Shale. It's actually within the Ledyard Shale, which is a member of the Ludlowville Formation. So we're getting down to some pretty specific detail here. Um, you know, well beyond what you can see in geophysical well logs, but even though we can't really see sedimentary features like this in well logs that easily, doesn't mean that they still don't provide us with pretty important insight as to what's going on depositionally um, in terms of bottom water oxygenation and those types of things, and therefore has some relevance to oil and gas exploration and, and um, unconventional resources. So I got a bit of a hike ahead of me here. Um, so I figured I'd talk to you a bit while I'm walking out here to get to the spot. But um, so that's what we're gonna do here for a bit. So I'll show you some of the trail here, talk to you a little bit as we get there and then we'll check out the rocks together. So a primer as to why I'm interested in these deposits is because there's two questions that commonly get asked about black shales at a, at a high level. And um, they all revolve around oxygen content and oxygen restriction. And very basically asked is, you know, were these black shales really deposited under anoxic conditions? And the problem I have with that question in general is it's rather reductionist in that it's sort of like all black shales must have been deposited under the same conditions, which they most certainly weren't. Um, they're deposited in a variety of environments from marine environments to lacustrian environments. They're deposited in open marine, restricted marine environments, variable marine environments. Within any shale, you can have parts of the basin are parts of the stratigraphy in time that were potentially anoxic or not anoxic at any time. So it's kind of a question that um, I don't really even like entertaining because I'm more interested in the nuance than a simple yes or no question. But um, if we want to ask, does you know anoxia ever exist? I think the answer to that is most definitely yes. We have a lot of examples of that in the modern day environments, you know, the most famous of which is the Black Sea, but, um, you know, also Frambiar and Ford, uh, Cariaco Basin, just to name a few. Um, there's other things like, um, you know, offshore upwelling zones that develop some degree of anoxia, even though it's ephemeral. And so it's hard to imagine that you have all these different environments where we have anoxia in the present day, but it never occurred in the geologic past. So certainly um, anoxia existed in the geologic past. So the next question a lot of people answer and will ask is, well, how much of the basin of the water column was anoxic? Are we talking about you know, a couple meters, tens of meters, the entire water column. And this is where I think looking at these pyrite beds can start to answer those questions. And I wrote a series of blog posts about these. I'll have a link to it um, in the description of this video that you can follow to my website. But um, it's gonna strike at the heart of that, so. We will trudge through this mud here, and I don't know if you can hear it slurping and slapping. It's pretty wet, rained yesterday, but uh, we'll get there and talk about it some more. All right, so welcome to this humble outcrop of the Alden Pyrite within the Ledyard Shale here. And um, this is the only exposure of it um, on this creek. It's just a small little little bank here that cuts through here and what you have is if you check this out you know you have this sort of um dark medium gray to dark gray shale here in the bank and some of it's fossiliferous where was it right there so there you can see the negative of a trilobite that was there um there's some spiriferid impressions down in here but when you start moving up through this section you'll start to find things like these. 
So this is a pyritic nodule. It's a little dirty here. Um, wash it off and see if you can start to see some of that, that sparkle on there. But um, so these are, these are pyrite nodules and there's a number of them of beds of these things in here and, and this is the Alden pyrite. These pyrite layers that, are, that come up through here represent rather stressed conditions. So the fauna are characterized usually as very diminutive forms. So if you start searching beds above and below these, you can find many of these same species, but they're much larger examples of them. Um, and generally what happens is that we have these low oxygen environments in species that have a tendency to remain enclosed upon death. So things like rolled up trilobites, um, burrowing clams, brachiopods, those sorts of things have a tendency to pyritize upon death because as that organic material decays, it creates this microanoxic environment inside that void. It extracts reactive iron from the surrounding shale here in, in this area and produces pyrite that fills that. So you end up with a fossil assemblage here that's largely pyritized, but the diminutive size of this fauna indicates that it was an oxygen poor environment. So enough oxygen to support life, but um, not enough to grow like really large, typical marine fauna that the Hamilton is well known for. But what I find really interesting about these things, what you end up finding are a number of cephalopods so you find, you end up finding examples of critters that live in the nectonic portion of the water column. So when people ask, you know, okay, well, how far up into the water column does this um, dysoxic conditions or anoxia extend? One way to look at that is the effect that, um, that we see on the nectonic critters and fossil assemblages here. And what we find in the Alden pyrite, these are actually pyritized worm burrows through here. Um, but what we find in the Alden pyrite is generally that even the cephalopods are diminutive in size. So they're not growing big either. So that's suggesting that the low oxygen, poor oxygen conditions that are being experienced in the bottom waters near or at the sediment water interface extend upwards some degree into the overlying water column and are affecting nectonic organisms as well. So, and, and the interesting thing about these deposits, these pyrite beds, is that they're generally adjacent to black shale. So you find them in transitions, both in time and space, between black shales and gray shales. So this is sort of like what's going on in the fringe of, of these black shale depositional basins here. So I, I think what they're giving you a indication of is the fact that at least when these Alden pyrite beds are being deposited, the bottom water conditions at the sediment water interface did indeed extend to some degree up into the water column such that it was affecting the growth of organisms up there as well. Now this is interesting when you look at things like the Marcellus Cherry Valley relationships where the Marcellus is nearly devoid of organisms. There are some, you know, um, very low diversity brachiopods, um, you know, glutinated forams, things like that, that suggest at times there might have been some bottom water oxygen. But then when you get into the Cherry Valley, um, very, very large and diverse fauna of cephalopods, trilobites, all those types of things in there. And uh, so what that's suggesting to me is that the anoxic conditions that we see manifest in the geochemistry of the black shales does indeed extend up into some significant portion of the water column such that it's hampering the growth of nectonic organisms. Because when we move into a fully oxygenated environment like Cherry Valley, we see a return of large nectonic organisms in there. And then when we move into the anoxic environments of the Oatka Creek or the Upper Marcellus, all those nectonic organisms, they all go away again. So that's why I find looking at these deposits in outcrop to be 
so significant because even though we can't see the stuff on a geophysical well log and breaking these things down into these small you know inch or foot thick beds is beyond the scope of what we can do or, or need from a geophysical well log when we're trying to quantify oil and gas in place the insight that we gain from these deposits can help us understand the depositional conditions under which these world-class reservoirs accumulate and help us um, explore and better develop them so I'm going to spend some time here seeing what I can find fossilized. I'll show you some examples of these things I'm talking about if I can find them and uh, we'll keep exploring. So I've come up section a little bit and if you note this overhang and this cliff face here, you can, you can look at this shale and see it's much darker gray and it, there even appears to be some really dark gray to possibly even black shales coming in. And in fact, you can actually find some black shale in the float. So we're getting up above those pyrite layers. So that's what I was kind of talking about. There are these transitional zones between, you know, your medium to light gray shales and these darker gray shales and black shales that you find um, nearby here, in this case, in a stratigraphic sense. This actually offers a nice view of some of these you know, gray shale hosted stratigraphically confined carbonate concretion horizons. So, you know, that's indicative of a hiatus and sedimentation around that level. If you want an example of high, higher diversity, here you go. This is a limestone hard ground, probably washed down from, you know, it's up above maybe the Wanaka or something like that. But there's a solitary coral there. Right there you have a, um, a tabulate coral, maybe it's pleuridictium or some sort of favicidid in there. Um, there's a bryozoan encrusted coral. There appears to be some crinoid segments in here. You have more corals in there. Uh, if we flip this thing over, what do we have on this side? So there's a number of, of brachiopods that we have down in here. So this is kind of typical ha um, Hamilton fauna that we're used to seeing um, in, in this neck of the woods here. So sometimes I like to walk this bank because you get fossils washing down from the lower horizon, or upper horizon, sorry. Um, but kind of typical Hamilton fauna stuff like that. So there's a big piece of a, a Therus shell. It's a Devonian, middle Devonian brachiopod. And then here. We have encrusted with bryozoans. Looks like maybe a cross section of a piece of a crinoid stem. This guy trying to hide from me. Where'd he go? There it is. Spiriferid brachiopod. Usually this bank is good for a few pleuridictium corals which are pretty neat because they settle on something hard on the soft mud below usually like a snail shell or something like that so you can usually see the impression of whatever it was the polyp settled down and the colony grew off of so I'll have to see if I can find one now that I've talked it up so much, or just have to cut this out of the video so that you're not all excited and then ultimately really disappointed. Well, this gravel bar is being lame. I mean, in its defense, the water is much higher than it normally is. Usually this is all dry land and you can walk around out there, but, ooh, there's one. Just as I insult it. Ooh, there we go. So that's Pleuridictium. And we'll see if it shows what it can't really tell. I think it's missing some. I'll see if I can find another one that shows the impression of whatever it attached to. But these are really cool. They're actually just up above where we are stratigraphically. It's known as the pleuridictium beds. I see what may be a promising gravel bar. Like right there so we're gonna walk up there here's a 
septarian nodule. It's what they often call turtle stones. They have nothing to do with turtles other than you get these geometric patterns in the concretion. They're probably some sort of like desiccation, dewatering thing, and then you get mineralization of uh, calcite, barite, siderite in there, and they create these. These actually can look pretty cool if I were to take that home and cut it and polish it, it'd look pretty neat, so maybe I'll do that because why not carry more weight home? Let's see if this gravel bar has anything of interest to offer. Here's a nice coral. A little water-worn, broken, but I'll take it because I made the effort to bend over and pick it up, so I figure I'll bring it back home. It's a nice little solitary horn coral here. I believe that this is Stereolasma rectum. That's the name of it. Who doesn't like a good rectum joke? Or name for their fossil. Here's another one. And there's another one. What else do we have laying around here? It looks like a big spear of fur, maybe? Nope, chunk of a coral. There's a nice spear of fur. Right there. It's the point where I realize I should have brought a bag. Another little coral, and another little spear of fur. A new different type of coral, I believe this is Trachypora, but don't quote me on that. Missed that one right there, but I didn't. Ooh, what do we have here? That's the problem with the wash stuff like this, is the wings often get busted off them but they're still pretty. Just tiny little corals laying all over here. There's another one out there. <laughs> another brachiopod. Another brachiopod. Ooh, what have we here? It's a piece of a trilobite. Uh, looks like it's rolled, maybe missing the head. Cool. More corals. I'm gonna check on this outcrop and look down here and there's a nice big etherus. Lots of corals, but then you can find big brachiopods too. So that right there, if it'll focus, it's a big mediospirifer. You can tell they got that real tall hinge line. That's how you can tell that that's a mediospirifer. It's a nice find. So here's a pleuridictium I just pulled out of the water and there you can clearly see the gastropod that it had attached to on there. So that's a nice one. Finally proves the point I've been trying to make. And this while I'm talking to you, there you can see it right here. Here's a big heliofilm coral. Big in diameter. It's the end of one. Let's see what else is. Sneak. Oh, look at that. That's still got the crinoid stem attached to it. Usually you just find the impression. You don't often find whatever it was that it actually attached to. So that would have sat like that and it grew off that little crinoid stem there. Well guys, I think that's it for this video. Um, hopefully you learned something interesting about this Middle Devonian Hamilton stratigraphy here. Um, again, this is the Alden Pyrite behind me in the Ledyard Shale, Ludlowville Formation. So, you know, this is sort of like mid-level of the um, Hamilton group between the Tully and the Marcellus, which are kind of two subsurface markers most people are familiar with there. So. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.